It's a joy to be with you this morning and to be able to worship God together, especially grateful for visitors in our midst. There are several of you this morning, some familiar faces, and we're thankful for your presence. And if you are visiting with us and you have not been with us before and you're new to um, what we've done here this morning, we'd love for you to ask any questions that might have come to your mind. And we just want to do everything by the good book all in accordance with the name of Jesus, Colossians 3 and verse 17 tells us that if we're not authorized to do what we're doing, then we ought not to be doing it. And so it would be our hope and our aim to give an answer from God's word for the things that we're doing. And we'd love you to ask any questions that you might have so that we can study the eternal things of God together. In Romans chapter 12 we, we alluded to this passage in the first hour about the greatness of sacrifice and that our sacrifice now is our entire lives present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. But in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul gives an examination of what that looks like, how it functions, I guess you could say that it functions according to the renewing of our mind, and that, of course, is by the Word of God. And there's a whole other lesson for that. I know that we've studied that before. But you notice the contrast. He says, do not be conformed to this world. And it becomes increasingly apparent to us as disciples of the Lord why the Bible as a whole, and especially for our concern of the New Covenant itself, is filled with warnings about being like the world. And all of the laws and the revelation of God's will under the Old Testament was really for the express purpose of setting them apart from the world so they're not like the nations. They don't carry themselves in that kind of immorality. Their worship is far different and superior, as it's from God Himself revealed, to those matters and aims of the nations. And that hasn't changed today. We've got to be set apart from the world, and it is the Word of God that's going to accomplish this. It definitely takes God's grace to keep us from the world and our compliance by faith. John 17 talks about how it was never God's intention for the apostles and, and also for us to take the apostles of the Lord out of the world, but that as they're in the world, they would be not of the world and they would be kept from the evil one, and while that is a fundamental truth, it is something we need to remind ourselves of constantly. And so there is virtue, there's, there is a reason why there's great value in the reminder of things. Paul would say in Philippians chapter 3, it's not tedious for me to speak the same things to you, but it's actually needful, it's helpful for us. And there are, there are things that I, I believe we take for granted sometimes that are wrong, that are sinful, and we wonder why we would need to talk about them. Well, it's because there is the tendency for us living in such an immoral and ungodly society in the world over to be desensitized to these things. For example, the sin of gambling is what I want us to think about this morning. It is everywhere you turn not just in Oklahoma with all the casinos that have to do with um, things specific to this state. Everywhere, everywhere there are casinos, there's gambling, there are lottery tickets being sold, and it is a pervasive problem. It's all, all on our television, isn't it? In 2018, Supreme Court lifted the ban on sports betting, and now you see it advertised incessantly. You can't watch a game. You can't turn the channel to a sports program without having an advertisement for sports gambling. It's right there at your fingertips on your phone. Your friends gamble, I'm sure. Even if you don't know it, people gamble. And it may be minuscule amounts in our minds and in their minds, innocent. But it's a great problem. But because of its pervasive presence in our society, I think we've been desensitized to it. When, when I drive by a casino and see all the cars there, there are times when I give some thought to that and how abhorrent it is and how sad it is. But more times than not, I don't even think twice about it. You see one of those 
uh, commercials that's advertising sports gambling and encouraging that kind of recklessness with people's hard-earned money. And we laugh at those commercials, don't we? Same problem with alcohol and other particular sins that the world tries to sell us. And I think desensitization is a real problem for us. We need to be abhorred by these things. And we need to be able to give a defense about why they're so wrong. No doubt it's a common vice, and it is a vice we must be aware of. There's, there's Gamblers Anonymous and a National Council of uh, Problem Gambling websites you can do, go to. And one of the questions that's asked, evidently it's one of the many asked questions it says, is gambling a vice? And they say, absolutely not. It's a sickness, this, that, and the other. It's a vice, brethren. It's sinful. And we need to be aware of that, and it's certainly common. Approximately 85% of U.S. adults have gambled at least once in their lives. 60% in the past year, some form of legalized gambling is available in 48 states, according to the National Council for Problem Gambling. In that same resource, it says 2 million U.S. adults are estimated to meet the criteria for severe gambling problems in a given year, and another 4 to 6 million would be considered to have mild or moderate gambling problems. And, and I'm not going to take it for granted that there's no one here who has ever temp- been tempted to do that or struggled with it. And, and that's what we're doing when we proclaim the gospel. I think Riley did an excellent job in, in looking at Acts chapter 20. And what we see displayed there is Paul's making the point, I didn't spend this time with you to just send you on your way and you do whatever you want with it. What we're doing here this morning is supposed to be very practical. If you've never been tempted to gamble or you've never gambled yourself, this is meant for you to see the danger of it and avoid it at all costs. It is meant for us who have been, I think, desensitized, like I mentioned, to be sensitized again at the abhorrent nature of it. And maybe you've struggled with gambling before. Maybe it was before you came to Christ and that's something you had to give up and it's a constant temptation and you need to be guarded against it. And maybe you're guilty of it sitting in the pew right now. You need to think about that. We need to make sure we're not taking part in the problems and sinful activity of the world. So let's consider what the problem with gambling is. I don't think that we really need to define gambling. I think we're all aware of it. But I think that it is something that is helpful as we think about some of the definitions and descriptions given so that we can understand exactly what constitutes gambling and why it would be wrong. The New Oxford American Dictionary says it means to play games of chance for money or to bet. And with each of these, you're going to see it kind of elaborated. And dictionary.com's definition, it mentions to stake or risk money. And so it's not just playing games where if you win, that's great. If, if you lose, you really don't lose anything. It's not really a loss. You're staking or risking money or anything of value on the outcome of something involving chance. And Encyclopedia Britannica gives a, a fleshier description of it. It is the betting or staking of something of value with the consciousness of risk and hope of gain. That's important. On the outcome of a game or a contest or an uncertain event, whose result may be determined by chance or accident or have an unexpected result by reason of the better's miscalculation. And so when we think about gambling, there's three elements that are always involved in gambling which constitute the sinful practice as a whole. An event or an outcome is uncertain. It's determined by chance. It's not something that is, is explained and told to the individual that this is going to happen. It's by chance, by definition. Gambling is by chance. It's staking of something upon the matter of chance, but with the hope of game. I want us to understand that. When a person gambles, regardless of what they tell you, they hope to gain. That's why they're doing it. And then lastly, there's always a winner and a loser. And sometimes the loser is hidden from us if we win. But there's always a loser, and that's important to remember. And it's at the expense of the loser as the money is compiled by many failures of others. And there's many forms of this, as I alluded to. There's a lottery. There is the casinos that we drive by all the time in this area and in other areas as well with various games and slot machines and poker and kinds of games I probably don't even know exist. There's also sports betting. There's betting on races. There's there's general wagers. I want us to understand that too. We're not just talking about the the projected and and valued games by the general community, but just a 
wager with your friends, a friendly wager, no matter how small. We'll talk about that a bit. But also there are, are raffles. And here's where, for the Christian, I think the question comes up from time to time, is you've got, a, you've got an event, a, a raffle that is put forward by a school or some kind of program that your kids may be involved in or your friend's kids may be involved in, and there is a good purpose to this. We're raising money for whatever it may be, the school event or the team or the program or the school itself, whatever it may be. So it's a good cause. And so, you know, I, I want to support this this institution and this effort. And so I can kind of play off and justify me buying raffle tickets because it's really just kind of a donation. But here's a question. Why not just donate? Why not just donate? If it's gambling, it doesn't matter what the cause is for. If we can see the Bible give us principles which would lead to the necessary conclusion that gambling is sinful no matter what, then we must avoid it no matter what. And I I hope that we'll be able to see that. I'm confident that we will be this morning. I think before we get to some of those points, I think it's important to address some, what I believe to be, attempts to divert us from the problem. Someone will say, well, you know, you say gambling is sinful, Jeremiah, or whoever's saying it, but you know, it's not wrong to seek to gain more. Why do you go to work every day? Why do you work hard at your job? Why do you ask for a promotion? Why would you leave one job to go to another job for higher pay? Isn't that what we're doing with gambling? We want to gain more. There's nothing wrong with gaining more. And I would agree to that. Gambling's not wrong because it's an attempt at financial increase. Notice in Luke, the 10th chapter, and in verse 7, when Jesus gives the limited commission, he'd tell those 70 to say, remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's true. That's a biblical principle. It is ingrained within the very fabric of our Bibles. It is not wrong to work and work hard to gain more. Wisdom tells us in Proverbs 10 and in verse 4 that he who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. It's not condemning becoming rich. It's not condemning working hard to gain more. It's actually telling us how we would do it in a godly manner. He who gathers in summer is a wise son, and he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. In the 13th chapter of Proverbs, in verse 11, it explains that wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. I want to suggest to you, and it has been suggested, that there are three methods of legitimately transferring money or property that we see sanctioned within the pages of our Bibles. We noted the first in Luke 10 and verse 7, a worker is worthy of his wages. You work, you earn. That is exactly the Bible principle and pattern that we see. But I suggest to you as well that there's another way in James, the fourth chapter. And while you're turning there, I want us to understand that he's being very specific about his condemnation in James chapter 4. There's a very specific problem with these people, but it wasn't buying and selling. It says, come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. And someone says, well, you know, he's condemning the, the decision to take time and effort and energy and resources to gain more, that the Christians should just kind of live in poverty, that there's some kind of virtue in that. There's people that believe in that. That's asceticism. And the Bible says there's no virtue in that whatsoever. He's condemning them, leaving God out of the picture. In verse 15, notice, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live to do this and that. He says, him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. They're going to such and such a place to buy, sell, and make a profit, and they're leaving God out of the picture, and it's neglecting their service to God. That's the problem. The legitimacy in this passage is buying and selling to make a profit. That's legitimate. They're just leaving God out of the picture and doing it. But also I think we can see by Scripture that gift-giving and receiving is certainly something that is godly. In 1 Corinthians Timothy 6, rather in verse 18, telling the rich what to do with their, their gain, he says, do good, be rich in good works, ready to give and willing to share. Over in Numbers chapter 27, you'll see the Mosaic law on inheritance. A person who gained an inheritance, and Ecclesiastes spends time and attention on this, they didn't work to earn that. And that's why it's considered vanity. If all you do is give your whole life to your work, you're leaving it to someone who didn't earn it, and they may squander it. 
but the inheritance itself is not ungodly. So when we're talking about the sinfulness of gambling, it's not sinful to aspire to bring in more income, especially when you're doing it for godly purposes and in godly ways to serve your family and and their needs, of course. Gambling doesn't fit any of these methods of work, exchange, or gift. Someone will say, well, you know, gambling's not wrong because we we take risks every single day. Well, gambling's not wrong because it involves risk. I understand we take risks every day. You know, the song says life is a gamble, a game we all play. I'd suggest to you that it's not really a gamble because if you look to the creator of life, he gives you certainty as to the outcome. And it's not a gamble if you avoid his word because you know and can know where you're going without his will. So life's not a gamble, though it does involve risk. But gambling is not wrong because it involves risk. In Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 11, it tells us, I returned and saw under the sun the race is not to the swift, the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Man also does not know his time. Like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, like the, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it saw, falls upon them suddenly. And so we're not saying gambling is sinful because it involves risk. You know, someone will liken gambling to farming because farming involves risk. I want to tell you that while farming may involve some risk, it also is resting on some very obvious natural laws and principles where there are things you can do and you can expect increase from them you sow you will reap and that's what we read as God gave promise to Noah in Genesis 8 and verse 22 while the earth remains seed time and harvest cold and heat winter and summer and day and night shall not cease and so while there may be some risk in it what's going to be my yield what's the weather going to do it's not gambling and gambling's not wrong because it involves risk there have been some who have suggested it's like buying insurance are you going to use insurance do you need that much insurance will it pay off in the end or not but that's not the same thing as gambling in it, buying of insurance there is the exchange between buyer and seller both stand to gain they gain in the addition to their business you gain in the protection of your property or whatever it may be that you're insuring your family may gain And in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, it tells us that we need to provide for our family. I think we can do so in part through investing in insurance. And then investing itself. Someone says, you know, the stock market's gambling. I believe you can be very reckless and certainly ungodly and sinful in your involvement in the stock market. But it is not inherently sinful, and it's certainly not the same as gambling. You remember in Matthew 25 and verse 27 with the parable of the talents that Jesus mentioned that man who hid the talent and did nothing with it, that he was wicked and said, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers at my coming. I would have received back my own with interest. And so there may be some risk involved, but it's certainly not something that is sinful in and of itself. In investing in the stock market, there's the buying and trading and selling of value and possessing of stake in a company. And so there is mutual benefit. And so that's a diversion, I think, from the issue at hand. I believe also a diversion is the degree of gambling. Someone says, well, you know, I understand gambling is is wrong, but if I'm just doing it for pennies at work, on my break, with my friends, or at school even with my friends, or there's just some little amount that I'm I'm gambling, or, or as I've demonstrated before, it's for a good cause, and it's not that much money anyways, and I would give it to them anyways. Well, the degree is not the problem. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and in verse 21, this is what Paul says about evil. He says, test all things and hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And I think sometimes we read, I believe it's the King James Version and other versions that say appearance, and we think that even if it appears to be evil, but it's not evil, you abstain from it. That's not what he's saying. He's speaking about how evil takes different forms. There's the form of adultery. There's the form of murder. There's the form of theft. If something is evil as we're asserting gambling to be, it doesn't matter the amount. You abstain entirely from it. I believe that this argument that it's a matter of degree comes from a place of immaturity and dishonesty and ungodliness itself. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 15, the Apostle Peter 
told the brethren there, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. That would preclude us from any bit of evil, no matter how small. If we're seeking holiness as God is holy and something is evil, we take no part in it whatsoever. And lastly, I think that there's a diversion from the problem and the fact that it's been made legal. It used to not be legal in many places. That should tell you something. Just like when there was a prohibition against the consumption and sale of alcohol, and now there is the legality of it, it should tell us something. There's something bad in it that even the world once was able to see, but now it's been made legal, and sports betting has been made legal, and it's celebrated, and it's encouraged. So we ought to be able to do that because the government has made it legal. Well, there's a principle that we need to understand as Christians. While Romans 13 says the authorities that exist are in existence from the appointment of God, and whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. We understand that with the harmony of Acts 5.29 and a host of other passages where Christians say we must obey God rather than men. And so when we think about the legality of a thing, if, if there's a requirement by God and the government would forbid it, we've got to do what God said, even if we go to prison for it, even if we're killed for it. But if there is a prohibition by God, it must be avoided even if the government requires it or allows it or it's celebrated. We ought to obey God rather than men. So it doesn't matter if it's legal or not. That goes for anything. What does God say? There's one other thing I think that we would do well to understand. Someone will say, well, the Bible does not specifically say that gambling is a sin. And so it must be okay. The Bible never says gambling is a sin. The Bible doesn't say anything about casinos or slot machines or any other thing along those lines for that matter. And, and so if God wanted us to avoid it, wouldn't he have told us clearly? Well, I think he would have told us clearly. I think he did tell us clearly. But I think this is this kind of argument from ignorance and immaturity again. Never in the Bible do we have any indication that God's intention in Revelation was to give us a handbook, an index of all the list of sins in their various forms and ways and capacities and contexts. What it does is it lays out eternal truth within the very nature of God and His created purpose. And it shows us everything we do need to see to be able to make proper, accurate judgments for time and eternity. You understand that? The Bible doesn't say anything about TVs or computers, yet men and women sin every day watching pornography. It doesn't say anything about that either. The Bible doesn't say anything about marijuana, does it? Yet that would be a sin, and I think we would agree with that. It doesn't say anything about bikinis, yet we know that's immodest and that's sinful. Think about this. It doesn't say anything about gay marriage, does it? It's speaks about homosexuality, but there's an argument out there, even I think among people who believe themselves to be believers, that, well, if it's a committed relationship, we're married by the law of the land, it's a committed relationship, it's not just, you know, uh, absent-minded sinfulness in sexual immorality, but it's a commitment, it's a a trust, it's a a binding of, of, of people together, that that's okay. The Bible doesn't say that gay marriage is sinful, but it does, doesn't it? doesn't have to specifically mention gay marriage because we know marriage is between a man and a woman. And so that comes from immaturity or ignorance. Notice in Hebrews 5 when he tells them that they should have grown to be able to teach, he explains that solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so maturity is about knowing God's word to the extent that I may see something that God said nothing about specifically. But I know he said something about that implicitly, that there are principles that go along with this discussion and a mature individual is able to discern that it is good or that it is evil. And that's where we get that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5 involving the word of God. Don't despise prophecies. Do not quench the spirit. Test all things. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from the evil. No, the Bible does not limit itself to explicit prohibitions. There are things that are prohibited by the pages of inspired history and law that show us they are 
there are things sinful that they may not specifically mention. Here's an example of this, I think, in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, where the writer is arguing for the superiority and supremacy of Christ's high priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek over against that of Aaron. There's a problem with that, though, because it says that the law said nothing about a man officiating at the altar that comes from another tribe other than Levi. And so he argues that there was a necessary change of the law. And he explained in verse 14, it's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. You'll never read in the Old Testament, thou shalt not have priests come out of Judah or Benjamin or Manasseh or any other place. That It doesn't say it. It speaks of Levi. That's all, all God had to do was specify that tribe and it necessarily implied that no other tribe could produce priests. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, we see something interesting that Paul puts in that list of sins that he mentions that are under the heading of works of the flesh. You notice after he lists those things, he mentions in verse 21, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I think we take that seriously. But did you notice after revelries, he mentions and the like, which I think stands for the whole list. And so he's not giving this exhaustive list of every single work of the flesh that is prohibited by God. He's giving us some main ones. He's giving us even some general categories under which other unspecified sins would fit. And that's when he says, and the like. There are things like this that I didn't mention. That's the whole point. And those are wrong too. In fact, if you practice things like this, even if I have not specifically mentioned them, the Holy Spirit is saying, you forfeit the kingdom of God. And so there are many forms of evil, but not every single specific form is mentioned explicitly in Scripture. In Romans chapter 1, when Paul talks about how the Gentiles gave themselves over to a debased mind and God gave them over to that mind to do the things which are unfitting, and it goes on and lists some sins, it mentions that they became inventors of evil things. Don't we see that today? Same old evil falls under the same old general category, even explicitly mentioned in Scripture, but it's very new. It's very new. Certainly we see that it does not have to be explicitly prohibited to be a sin. But I do believe that it is a necessary conclusion if we take Scripture and what it says that gambling is indeed sinful. So I want us to think about six points that makes us understand the problem of gambling. There are six positive points, things that it is, and or three positive points, things that it is, and three negative points, things that it violates in principle. I want to suggest to you that first and foremost, gambling is a sin because it is a form of covetousness. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and in verse 3, in a context encouraging Christians to be imitators of God, to walk in the light, the Apostle Paul would say, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. It's not even to be named among us, covetousness. And you notice in verse 5, he says, no fornicator or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and in God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. So even the people that would have you to believe gambling is not sinful and it is okay for a Christian to participate in. He says, stay far away from those people. It's covetousness. The word covetousness is the Greek word pleonexia. It's a compound word from pleon more and echo to have. And so it's literally the desire to have more. Strong's definition of pleonexia gives us another word to think about. He calls it avarice, that is fraudulency or extortion. Avarice is extreme greed for wealth or material gain. Arton Gingrich says that pleonexia is the state of desiring to have more than one's due. Greediness, insatiableness, avarice, covetousness. And so it's not just, okay, I'm going to work within what God has given me to work and to gain what is my due in a spirit of contentment. But it is this greedy desire for more than what is 
your due. That's covetousness. And I want to suggest to you that every time there's an instance of gambling, it's covetousness. I appreciate the reading of 1 Timothy chapter 6 by Gunner before the lesson. In verse 9, it tells us that those who desire to be rich, that's covetousness in a descriptive way. They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith and the greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And I think that's where we get this fuller idea of covetousness. In Colossians 3 and verse 5, Paul calls it idolatry. You notice there in verse 10 of 1 Timothy 6, they stray from the faith. And so this comes between them and their God becoming in essence their God. In Matthew 6 and verse 24, Jesus would say that no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. I want to tell you very plainly and clearly, gambling is always covetousness. You may argue there's various degrees of it. You may argue that someone's worse at it than you are, that you don't really have that much greed but it's covetousness. Someone says, but getting rich and wanting more, it's not why I gamble. I do it for the fun. Okay. You know, that's the same kind of argument that I've heard people make about drinking wine. I do it for the antioxidants. Don't do it for the alcoholic consumption. You can drink Welch's for the antioxidants that are in the fruit of the vine. It doesn't come from the alcohol. That's not the benefit. And so that's a, that's a moot point. That's... That's a red herring. That's not the issue here. You can drink something else for those kinds of nutritional benefits. You don't need the alcohol. In fact, the alcohol is the poison. It's the same thing here. You can play games. You can watch sports. And you can guess with your friends who's going to win, who's going to lose, so that you can have bragging rights that I got it right, I saw it, you didn't. But money being involved, high stakes being involved, that's covetousness. The only addition of money to the equation does is it gives incentive to gain more money at the expense of another's loss. If that's not your purpose, then play the game without the money. Watch the game without the money. Do you understand the foolishness of that argument? Always when there's money involved, when it is gambling, those three elements are involved, there is an effort to gain what is not rightfully yours. And whether one can say that they are doing it just for fun or not is beside the point. This is what Jesus said himself in Luke 12 and verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. If Jesus tells us to beware of something, do we do something that might get us to that thing? No, we steer clear of it. That's where this idea of even the appearance of evil may come because he's talking about a man who came up to him saying, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Inheritance is not sinful. But this man was displaying a covetous attitude and motive, so he said, beware of covetousness. So if you're going to argue that gambling for me is not covetousness, well, even if that's true, which it's not, why would you ever do something that will breed covetousness? When Jesus says, beware of it, it's covetousness. All the time, all day, and a Christian should have nothing to do with it. And I want to tell you as well that it's stealing by consent. Gambling is an effort to take what is another's without their desire to give it. You may say, why'd they put their money on the table then? Why'd they stick that quarter in the slot machine or whatever it was? They don't want to give that. It's not a donation. It's not charity. It's not a gift. It's not benevolence. It's not a trade or a purchase for goods, and they're not doing it to lose it, but to gain. And when they don't win, they feel the loss. And they regret it. And they try to gamble more to recoup the loss. And so this is stealing by consent. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, and in verse 28, the Apostle Paul said, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So there's the gaining without labor that is considered there. That's what stealing is. Gambling is gaining without labor, isn't it? There's the taking of what is another's. That's what theft is. You're taking someone else's money. You're harming another. And the Holy Spirit tells us that the exact opposite of gambling is what a Christian should be involved in. You work and earn it. It's a sure thing. 
and when you earn it, you use it in a good way to benefit others who have a lack. Gambling is the exact opposite. It brings victims into the equation. And as you gamble, you are the one who is causing the harm. You know, the institutions that involve themselves in gambling, the commercials we see, they never show us the victim, do they? And so you don't feel bad participating in it unless you become the victim. There's always a victim. In a documentary on Michael Jordan's career, one of his teammates was telling a story about them being on a plane. Michael Jordan and some other men were in the back of the plane betting large, absurd, and immodest amounts of money in a game of poker. And Michael Jordan went up to the front of the plane and asked John Paxson if he could play with them as they were only wagering dollars every hand. And he said, Michael, why do you want to bet with us when we're only betting dollars? And Michael said, according to him, I want to say I got your money in my pocket. Regardless of the attitude, that's what gambling is. It is your money, and I'm putting it in my pocket. It's stealing by consent. I want to tell you along those same lines that gambling is very destructive in its nature. So you got three positive reasons why. It is covetousness. It is stealing. And it is destructive. Remember in 1 Timothy 6 and in verse 9, that they fall into temptation and a snare, those who desire to be rich, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. In fact, covetousness, the love of money, is a root of all kinds of evil. People stray from the faith in their greediness. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. There's nothing like that in the Scripture that God sanctions and condones. There is a fundamental principle throughout the Word of God that comes into our daily judging of whether something is good or evil. Specifically in Matthew 7, Jesus talks about judging a person's doctrine and their practice and teaching by their fruits. If it is not something that is in harmony with the Word of God, you know that it's a bad tree. And he explains, you will know them by their fruits. Did men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. I understand that time and chance happen to them all, so we may do something and something bad may happen, but the doing of that thing, its very essence, what it is, does not breed or yield destructive fruit. But when a thing yields destructive fruit, you know that that thing itself is destructive. I think there's a a parallel to this from Proverbs 23 when it talks about the dangers of alcohol. He asks some question. He shows the fruit. He says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions, complaints, wounds without cause, redness of eyes? That's the fruit. And he says, those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. I think we could ask some similar questions. Who has heavy debt leading to personal ruin? Whose family is destroyed? Who has mental and emotional problems leading to suicide in many cases of depression and anxiety? Who is abusing substances and is antisocial in their personality, not caring who's hurt and who's harmed? Who is feeding their problem of gambling with other crime and sin? Addictions.com says an estimated 50% of those affected by gambling problems commit crimes in order to support their addiction. Who's addicted? Why do the foundations, Gamblers Anonymous, and the National Council on Problem Gambling exist? Because gambling is destructive. It destroys everywhere it goes. It leaves a wake of sorrow and destruction. Christians shouldn't be a part of it. I mentioned in 2018 the Supreme Court lifted the federal ban on sports gambling And since then, I'm sure you've seen many of those kinds of commercials. One that's always stood out to me is associated with the NFL and the National Council Council of Problem Gambling. And the commercial is this this play that actually happened in one of the seasons. And you see the X's and O's on a screen. And the announcers are saying, well, this is going to wrap it up. And then the unthinkable happens, and they score. And across the screen, it says, unbelievable happens. So if you bet, set limits. Only bet what you can afford to lose. Why do they have to say that? Because there are people who ruin their lives by taking out bets on meaningless games. 
gambling is destructive. But it also violates the divine principle of work ethic. There in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is dealing with a very particular problem of brethren who have been convinced that the second coming of Christ is imminent. It's right around the corner within their lifetime. And so they've done what a lot of people continue to do today as people predict the second coming of the Lord. They quit their jobs. They sell what they have. They just kind of sit around and wait on it. And as it doesn't come, then they need, but they don't have because they've given it all away. And so he addresses a specific problem and tells them to withdraw from those who are disorderly. And he says in verse 7, you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. In what specific way here? We did not eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. He says, we told you, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you disorderly in manner and not working at all, but are busybodies. So we exhort that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And so we have a biblical principle. Their problem was not gambling, but they weren't working. They were eating other people's hard-earned food and money that purchased that food. They weren't working, so they shouldn't be eating, is Paul's argument. You work and eat your own bread, is what he says. And so the principle sets that one is finding sustenance and needs met in an honest labor through ways which are with work and labor, not through ways which avoid work and take advantage of another person's benevolence and hard-earned money. And so the problem is not gambling, but it falls under this general principle of work ethic. It's not a condemnation of gift giving and receiving or an inheritance or benevolence in the case of legitimate needs. These people could have provided for themselves. They wanted what they did not work for. That's the problem. He said in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 11, aspire to live a quiet life, mind your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you. So you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Again, don't steal any longer, but work with your hands and provide for others who cannot. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. That would preclude us from falling into these get-rich-quick schemes. I believe that there are times when Christians fall into something that is very foolish, imprudent, that in and of itself may not be sinful, but that would involve sin and the fact of recklessness of what they're doing and trying to gain something out of very little work. Well, gambling is gaining and avoiding work at all. And so it also violates the principle of work ethic. It also violates the principle of good stewardship. In Luke, the 16th chapter, Jesus would preach the parable of the unjust steward, not sanctioning his actions, but commending his mindset of providing for his future But I want us to notice the application there, which has a very wide range as it pertains to what we're doing with not just our money, but our physical possessions and time and energy and bodies even. And he says, I say to you, make friends for yourselves, verse 9 of Luke 16, by unrighteous mammon. That's just mammon that that is of the world. It's not unrighteous in itself. It's just does not have any righteous value to it. That when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. And then he says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your true trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? He says, you cannot serve both God and mammon then, as we're to use these things even for the service of God. There's a legitimate and important biblical principle of good stewardship that applies everywhere, including our money. And throwing it away at the poker table or the slot machines, or even the raffle for that matter, that's not good stewardship. It's not protecting your family or your needs or your brethren's needs. What about an individual who throws away their money in a gambling scheme and now doesn't have the money to contribute to work that the church must carry out by God's authority? Good stewardship is not performed in gambling. In fact, it's the exact opposite of good stewardship. While it's by chance there is something that you can count on, the house always wins. You heard that saying, house always wins. 
there may be a winner here or there, but ultimately the reason why it's big business is because the odds are in the house's favor. There's an article on the Powerball in AP News that said the odds of winning a Powerball jackpot, no matter the size, no matter the size, and it only grows as it grows, they stand near 1 in 292.2 million. Chances of taking home Mega Millions top prize are even lower at about 1 in 302.6 million. And there are other great odds as well in other games. But notice this. The article said, because of the almost impossible chance of winning big, experts stress that you shouldn't spend all your money on lottery tickets. I'm not an expert, but I would say don't spend any money on it. Can you imagine standing before the throne of Christ, giving account for all your deeds and especially the things that God had entrusted you with? Your time, your money, your possessions, your family, your brethren, your relationships, and you've got to give an answer for throwing what God has entrusted you with in the garbage. You don't have anything to answer for it. You don't have mega millions. You didn't win. It didn't pay off. And even if it did, you gained the world and lost your soul. We need to think about these things. And lastly, and certainly not least, it violates the principle of love. Jesus said this command is only second to the love of God, and that's to love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke 6 and verse 31, Luke 6 and verse 31, Jesus said, just as you want men to do to you, you also do likewise to them. I want to tell you, every person that places a bet and loses the bet wished it didn't happen to them, but they are dealing out that punishment on the person across the table from them. Jesus says, do to others as you would have them do unto you. In Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul puts in a very impressive and powerful manner that we are to owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I mentioned earlier that the institutions and the commercials, they don't want you to see the negative side. Any more than commercials of alcohol and other things want you to see the negative side of it. They want you to see big wins, big houses, big bank accounts, smiling faces. But behind that is the truth. There's broken homes. There's destitute children. There's crying spouses. There's utter loss. There's men and women taking their own lives. There is ruin and calamity brought on by those decisions people have made for themselves. That's not love. And every time someone gambles, even a Christian, they contribute to that kind of destruction. A church father, Tertullian, as they're called, once said that if you say you are a Christian when you are a dice player, you say what you are not because you are a partner with the world. I want us to think about that and avoid this vice at all costs. I know that the things we've talked about this morning have not pertained to the milk of the word of how to become a Christian, but we never want to leave without offering that invitation the Lord Jesus came in the flesh and he lived his life and he died and was raised from the dead and sent the Holy Spirit to reveal the plan of salvation according to his death that takes away sins. He says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. You can be risen to walk in newness of life today by the power of God's grace through the resurrection of Christ. We, we can assist you in that. We want you to come forward. If there's any other spiritual need we can assist you with, Come forward while we stand and sing.